You're listening to the summary of the interview. For a link to the full-length episode, please check the description below. We're going to listen to an interview with Eric Jackson of Pipeline Foods, where we are discussing large-scale conversion of land to organic farming. What holds farmers back while the demand is growing so rapidly? Welcome to another episode of Investing in Regenerative Agriculture, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, a podcast show where I talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why my focus on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land, grow our food and what we eat. And it's time that we as investors, big and small, and consumers start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. Before we get started, I've been recording these interviews next to my day job and I will definitely continue to do so and release about an episode a month. But at the same time, I would love to take this further, share more interviews. There are many more stories to share on investing in regenerative food and agriculture. More depth, improve the quality, maybe even doing some video series. So I started a Patreon community, which makes it easy to support creators like myself. If these podcasts have been of value to you, and if you have the means, I invite you to support me and make this happen. For more information, please find the link to my Patreon account in the description below. And now, without further ado, the interview. Enjoy! Well, uh, like many of folks my age um, who've been in agriculture for, for a career, when we started in the business, in my case, 35 years ago, we were never given any information and it really wasn't the topic of conversation about how agriculture and sustainability work could work together. Um, but, but agriculture, particularly production agriculture, uh, as a carbon sink was something that was a relatively new uh, across the, even across the sustainability community. The idea of using uh, minimum tillage uh, in, in concert with nature as opposed to fighting. Um, fighting nature every step of the way during the growing season was producing uh, every bit as much yield for these guys as, um, as conventional and their cost structure was much lower because they weren't using, they weren't having to buy all these, all these inputs. Multi-generational farms, you know, that, that would do something uh, for a long period of time, the same year after year, uh, and then they recognized that some of the things that their grandfather used to do was actually better. Um, started bumping in more and more to uh, folks that were at least diversified into into organic row crop production. I was looking at the at the marketplace and watching the growth in the in the industry. Um, you know, double digit growth year over year for many many years. And again, with my commercial hat on, I was wondering what had been, what was being done in terms of the infrastructure and the supply, yeah. or the supply, right? So the, the the midstream between the farmer and the consumer, there's a lot of steps that happen, and I, I I was fascinated to try to figure out and see if that if that infrastructure had been keeping up with, you know, with the, with the whole marketplace, and I found out that it hadn't. That both sides of the of the pipe can benefit if the pipe is built in such a way that. It, it honors the desires on the demand side and honors the desires on the supply side. So today, uh, after not quite 18 months in business, uh, we have uh, a headquarters here in Minneapolis. We have a team in Canada that manages our Canadian program. We have a team in Buenos Aires that manages our South American program. And we've created a, a partnership with a like-minded group out of Europe that gives us a, a global program uh, in terms of being able to work directly with growers today in about 20 countries. Uh, so we said, let's be completely transparent and create sort of a two-way telescope uh, consistent with the, uh, with the thesis of a pipe, I guess, um, and give both visibility to, to each other uh, and, and strengthen the food system in, in, in a way that hasn't really been done, at least at a commercial scale before. So. Again, today, like you said, we have we have some somewhere in the neighborhood of 50, uh, just over 50 people. Um, we have three grain ele four grain elevators. I'm sorry, two in two in Saskatchewan and two in North Dakota. We have a small oilseed crushing operation in Missouri. 
I'm quoting here, perhaps one of the hardest parts of this journey is to walk into a, a local coffee shop and getting the cold shoulder for doing something different. How do you work on that psychology piece that I'm going to be the, the weird one in the village um, and yeah. the community because I'm going organic and going to have a very messy field? One of the things that we're starting to do is to create a community uh, and connecting all, you know, various farmers to each other, giving them the opportunity to understand that although they may be odd in the local coffee shop, that in the, in the global coffee shop, they're not that odd. And, and in terms of what, what means regenerative agriculture for, for pipeline foods and what are your plans in that? To make change is when you can connect the demand side to the supply side because the primary exchange is money, right? And without money, you're, you're, the universe of participants shrinks to only those who are mission driven, which is important, but in, in my mind, not sufficient. So we're trying to figure out how this, how the signals are going to get sent, if you will. Um, and regenerative is a new, is a relatively new signal in the commercial world. Our, our approach at this point is a little bit of a wait and see, not because individually as people we aren't sympathetic to, um, you know, many of the ideals expressed in, in regenerative, in the regenerative conversation. I tell my team, at some level, we shouldn't care about motivation as long as the outcomes are aligned with our uh, business philosophy and our ethos. So if a person, if a grower, for example, is solely motivated by money, uh, and that's the way that we can get that grower to behave in a different way, that creates an economic opportunity for the grower and an abundance of uh, additional environmental outcomes, we shouldn't care. We shouldn't be so altruistic that that we need for uh, to stand up and salute, you know, some sort of flag or, or some sort of icon. Uh, we, we should really care about the outcomes of the endeavor. And so with soil health being really the topic that's driving that conversation, now getting commercialized by major food companies uh, and major participants in the value chain, out of that conversation now. In the US, one of the things that um, has become apparent, more apparent now to the rural communities is that they're groundwater. Uh, so in addition, take away the surface water discussion and go to groundwater. Um, many of the rural community wells that, that would be supplying a small town uh, are impaired in terms of water quality. And it, it's, it, there's no secret about what the source of that impairment is. It's clearly uh, agricultural leaching. Now, if I could snap my fingers and turn the entire world organic overnight, uh, I do not believe at this point, I wouldn't have said this a few years ago, but I do not believe at this point that I, that you would see any decrease in production. And in fact, I would argue that over the long term, this is the only way that things can, can work over the long term, uh, but you'd see an immediate impact in terms of environmental outcomes. And I think people would be astounded and understand that they've been fed a bunch of stories that aren't necessarily true about the need for using uh, synthetic production methods, um, you know, to be able to feed the world. This whole feed the world concept is a red herring. Another interesting point of tension is because you've got the, what I'll call the legacy organic um, crowd who are typically uh, farming smaller acreage. Um, and very intensive, you know, uh, maybe 40 different crops on an acre, right? But it's mostly designed for local use. Um, and fruit and vegetables, yeah. And fruits and vegetables, and that's great. And not grain. But yeah. it's great. I mean, it's, it, it, that's the food I want to eat, and I'm glad that, 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 that those programs are up and going, but that is not going to make a, a systemic change uh, on uh, you know, a local, regional, or certainly global level, you have to get the broad acre. What kind of uh, size you are dealing with? Yeah, so I, I mean, some of these, some of these uh, figures are estimates, but um, in our most recent review of the uh, acreage 
that we are currently working with. Uh, North America, I believe it's 1.4, give or take 1.4 million acres. You know, investment in in soil health. I mean, you can you can create a, a whole wheel of fortune, if you will, with lots of slivers of of benefits, um, all coming from essentially the same thing. You know, and, and so the if you can pool capital and that capital can be put to work to help sponsor the initiation, because because our biggest problem in the U.S. is we do not have enough acres that are organic to support. Our domestic demand so we're, we're importing now granted we're always going to import things we can't grow here but we import 75 percent of our organic corn and soybeans but the but the point is we are the king of soybeans and corn and yet we're importing organic soybeans and organic corn because they don't grow enough here you just listen to the summary of the interview for the full-length interview please find the link in the description below If you found the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast valuable, there are a few simple ways you can use to support it. Number one, rate and review the podcast on your podcast app. That's the best way for other listeners to find the podcast, and it only takes a few seconds. Number two, share this podcast on social media or email it to your friends and colleagues. Number three, if this podcast has been of value to you, and if you have the means, please join my Patreon community to help grow this platform and allow me to take it further. You can find all the details on patreon.com slash regenerative agriculture or in the description below. Thank you so much and see you at the next podcast.